I'm Julia Hull, host of WTF Biology and PhD candidate studying the biology and ecology of plant-associated fungi. Thank you so much to all of you who are letting your friends, family members, co-workers, and random people know about the show. It really helps spread the word so more people can enjoy the weirdness of the natural world. And a huge thank you to all the patrons on patreon.com slash WTF Biology. There, for just a buck a month, you'll get exclusive access to a bunch of bonus content, like extended interviews and deleted scenes. If you haven't already, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, where I post cool-ass nature shit videos. The link is in the show notes. In these couple-minute videos, I show you around my forest or wherever I happen to be and point out shit that I think is cool. And if you like those, you can join patreon.com slash WTF Biology for five bucks a month and get access to cool-ass nature shit videos that exist nowhere else. These videos usually provide a little bit more information about the topics discussed in the podcast. So, now the business is out of the way, let's get on to the show. Welcome to What the Fuck Biology, the show where we discuss the overlooked and underappreciated weirdness that exists in the world around us. Today, we will discuss the biological luggage that mountain pine beetles pack around with them and what that means for the forest health in Western North America. Joining me today is PhD candidate in the School of Forestry at Northern Arizona University and awesome friend, Sneha Vissa. Thank you for joining me today. I'm really excited to talk about mountain pine beetles. So I'll just have you introduce yourself, your name, where you work, what your position is, and all that stuff. All right. Thank you, Julia. Thanks for having me. It's great to talk about bark beetles. So my name is Sneha, and I'm a PhD candidate in the School of Forestry at NAU. And I work on biotic and abiotic effects on the symbiotic associations and interactions of bark beetles. So what that means is how things like climate, tree defenses, and interaction with other organisms affects the fitness and the success of bark beetles and their effects on tree killing and forest tree health. Um, I also got my master's in forestry in the same field a few years ago. I think that was 2017. Um, And my background, however, is in biology and ecology, which is what I got my undergrad in. That's kind of what kicked it all off. Yeah. So what did get you interested in uh, biology and forestry? I think I always knew that biology would be a part of my life ever since I was in grade school. It was the one class that I enjoyed the most. I had an excellent teacher in middle school and high school. I was also really into English. So I was a double major English and biology in college. And I kind of wanted to put those two things together, do science and then be able to communicate it through writing, which is essentially what scientists do. And then I think a lot of the ecology based outdoor classes that I took really fueled my interest in working in you know in an outdoor setting Mm -hmm. and forestry in particular I didn't grow up in pine forest ecosystems it was really novel and new to me when I moved out here and I think that's one of the reasons I really wanted to work in it so I could learn things that I didn't already know okay so you study mountain pine beetles um, and Mm -hmm. what plants do these affect That's a really good question because there's lots of different kinds of trees. But a mountain pine beetle, they occur all across Western North America. And they show, you know, variable associations with trees across their distribution. So, for example, they are primarily found in ponderosa pines and lodgepole pines in Colorado. But if you consider northern Arizona, they're only found on five needle white pines, even though ponderosa pines are plenty. It's kind of, um, I'm not exactly sure why. We don't really know. It could be the adaptation of our ponderosas. It could be a lot of other different things. So their associations are variable, but they generally like pine trees and the genus Pinus. And there's lots of different kinds. So there's lots of things that affect how mountain pine beetles impact the trees, right? Yep. 
It seemed like whenever we started a new uh, group of organisms, we'd have to learn their life cycle. And it was like so boring and annoying that we had to learn all these life cycles until as an undergrad, I realized, oh, we're just talking about how things have sex. Okay, yep. cool. <laughs> I'm down with this now. <laughs> <laughs> Being able to understand the life cycle allows us to understand the basic biology. And so especially if this is a pest organism, we have to know what it needs in order to complete its life cycle and all the different stages of that life cycle so that we can effectively manage this pest organism. Yeah, I totally get that because I think when you're in grade school, they make you memorize those life cycles. It's not really a fun thing, right? Right. But yeah, it's really important for insects especially. And I think a great example is when these tussock moths as caterpillars attacked a bunch of trees in Colorado and everyone was just like, you need to figure out a way to get rid of them. And then they came in and sprayed this pesticide. But by the time they'd sprayed it, all the caterpillars had pupated. So the pesticide didn't even affect them. So if they hadn't, you know, they'd spent a little bit of time considering the life cycle and what stage it was going to be in. You know, mm -hmm. maybe some of those treatments would have been better. So let's talk about the life cycle of the mountain pine beetle for a minute. Um, they have a really unique life cycle. They take a whole year to develop into adults. And most of their life is spent underneath the bark of a tree. So what's going on is, you know, hard to tell if you can't see. But of course, we've done a lot of studies and stuff. It all starts with a female adult beetle flies around and finds a suitable tree. And there's lots of factors that drive what a suitable tree is. The age, the size, the species. Um, and then she starts chewing an entrance hole into the bark of the tree. So while she's doing this, though, she releases these pheromones, which are chemical cues that guide other mountain pine beetle females to the same tree. And the reason for this is, you know, when one little beetle goes and starts chewing on a tree, that tree is going to start releasing resin chemicals to defend itself. And for one beetle, that's overwhelming. But if there's a hundred beetles on the same tree, those defenses get exhausted and those females can colonize the tree successfully. So once they've done that and they've entered the tree, they start making tunnels underneath the bark. And when they're doing that, they change their pheromone and release a pheromone to attract male beetles. So when that pheromone gets released, the males show up and start burrowing into these tunnels that the females have made. And it's really cute because the males make this high-pitched chirping sound to let the females know that they've arrived and they're ready to have sex. So they're like, hey, ladies, uh -huh. I'm here. <laughs> Males can be picky. They can just be like, no. And sometimes there can be, you know, multiple males that come in and then males fight over the female. Meanwhile, the female's like, look, I'm just going to keep tunneling. You guys figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> but once they mate, though, they act as partners and they make these tunnels together. So they're making homes for their offspring together underneath the trees. It's kind of, it's sweet. And then the female lays eggs along these tunnels. We call these tunnels galleries. So the eggs are laid along these galleries. And what both the parents are doing is that they're also depositing a fungus along the walls of these galleries, which will later serve as a nutritional supplement for the larvae when they hatch. So okay. when the eggs hatch, it takes a couple of weeks, the eggs hatch, the larvae feed on the fungus line galleries, but then they also, you know, expand those galleries as they grow and as there's more of them. They go through a winter and their larval stage, you know, they kind of slow down when it gets really cold. And then they form pupas in the spring. And then in the summertime is usually around when these pupae, you know, start breaking apart. The adults come out. It takes them a little while for them to, you know, harden their outer shell. So insects have an exoskeleton. When they come out for the first time for their pupa, it's really soft and they're really vulnerable. They're actually a really pretty, like, gold color when that happens. And then they harden up and become, like, you know, dark brown, black little beetles. But once all that happens, they chew themselves out of the bark. And then they go looking for a new tree to start this whole process again. And we call that the flight when a bunch of beetles come out of the trees and fly looking for new trees. Okay, so they kind of all emerge relatively simultaneously. So you kind of get these big clouds of mountain pine beetles that are exiting from the tree where they were born and then looking for new trees so that they can make more babies. Mm hmm so we know that the climate is warming, and as things get warmer, the beetles' range is also expanding. So why is that, and where are the beetles moving to? 
So warming is always usually associated with, you know, improved reproduction in insects. Um, what that generally means for mountain pine beetles is, you know, there's more beetles because higher winter temperatures just means that there's going to be a higher survival rate over the winter. Um, a lot of times these beetles are cold limited. We rely on the natural order of things when it gets really cold, some of them are going to die. But thank you global warming. <laughs> We're seeing less and less of that um, as the years go by. And typically winters that are super cold and can limit these populations are not really warm. So there's just more of them. Warm temperatures can also speed up the developmental process. So the time taken till pupation and then emergence. And for a lot of other bark beetles that have shorter life cycles, um, you know, it doesn't take a whole year that could mean an increase in the number of flight events for beetles. There's been speculations of two flight events in a year for mountain pine beetles in some places when it should be one flight event per year. Okay, so due to warming. Mm -hmm, due to warming. And the speculation is that, you know, the whole life cycle is just getting sped up. And if it's warm enough to emerge, they'll emerge. It also means that places that were once too cold for the beetle to survive becomes habitable. And as long as there's, you know, viable host trees, you can bet that the beetles will go there if it's warm enough and if the winters aren't too cold. And a classic case with this, with the mountain pine beetle, is its expansion in Canada, especially into British Columbia, which is way up there in the north, right? I think mm -hmm. most populations in Canada kind of got blocked off at Alberta and then about, I don't know, a couple of decades ago, we started seeing that they were just moving more and more north because of those warming temperatures. Right. So another consideration is um, when it gets really hot, the trees can get stressed. And so when the trees are stressed, they might not be able to have as good of defenses against the female beetles when they come and start burrowing into the into the bark. Yeah, that's that's another consideration that warming and especially when the warming is coupled with drought stress, that's when trees are a little bit too stressed out to produce enough defenses and they can be easily overwhelmed. So that is definitely another consideration. Awesome. So a lot of your research uh, involves not necessarily the mountain pine beetles themselves, but all the critters that live um, and are associated with the mountain pine beetles. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. I kind of live by the mantra that no organism can exist in isolation. So it's like how you and I have microbes that digest our foods. We have mites on our eyelashes and skin that are eating all our dead cells and we can't see them. You know, it's the same right. for any other animal, whether it's an insect or a rat or whatever. So mm -hmm. beetles are also carrying a lot of little friends and also not so good friends that influence <laughs> them and their interactions and their reproduction production and you know what's happening inside that tree things that we cannot see so i think fungi right. are probably the best example with mountain pine beetles like i'd explained um adult beetles carry a special fungus that they put in the galleries and are used as a nutritional source so that's an example of you know beneficial or friendly interaction between the fungus and the beetle and they pretty much rely on each other to live <laughs> right right so the fungus is transported by the adult beetles um and then the fungus grows inside the tree, takes nutrients from the tree. The young beetles then um, are eating the fungus. So both the fungus and the beetles are benefited from interacting with each other. Right, they're getting their nutrition from the tree tissue. They also carry mites, which is primarily what I study. And many of these mites can directly prey on beetle eggs. Like I've seen videos and this is really cool. It's, I don't think it's out there. There's one lab that actually does this where they put a tiny camera into the galleries of the beetles and then we can watch what's happening with mites and beetle eggs and i've seen mites like attach onto beetle eggs and literally suck the juice out of it oh wow <laughs> i know it's kind of crazy <laughs> they can introduce new fungi into the environment that competes with the beetles friendly fungus and the nutritional fungus they can also spread good fungi bad fungi just change the environment of the beetles entirely so they're playing many different 
different roles in these beetle environments, but it's kind of hard to pinpoint exactly what they're doing when you can't really see them and you don't really know a whole lot about them. Right. So let's take a step back for a second and just talk about mites. Like how big are these things? What are they related to? And that kind of stuff. So mites are very, very, very tiny. They could be less than a millimeter. They could, and then I guess the largest mite would probably be, hmm, maybe a couple millimeters would be the largest mite, but that's very large. Um, they're usually, you know, so, so, so tiny. You need a compound microscope to see them. So it's like, this is beyond millimeters. This is micrometers. They're so, so tiny. So they're microscopic. Uh-huh. Like, there's no way that we can really see. Them. There are, there are some that you can totally see you know they look like big orange dots that are moving like some you can see some not so easily some of them are even translucent which is crazy so even using a compound light microscope you might not be able to see them because right it, it totally depends though um i think it's about how training yourself to spot them at this point i could probably spot one pretty easily under a dissecting microscope but you know it took me a long time to be like oh my gosh that's a mite (laughs) (laughs) they're arachnids so they're related to spiders they are in they're akari which are you know related to arachnids they're their own group okay they're more closely related to ticks oh okay Mm -hmm. great So you just recently published a paper looking at mites throughout the Mount Pine Beetles range, um, five sites ranging from Arizona to Alberta. Um, Why is it important to know how mite populations change across this landscape level? So different populations of beetles can behave differently or respond to things differently based on where they're from. So, you know, we've seen studies where the way beetles adapt to changes in temperature or um, fungi that beetles are associated with can vary based on what population we're looking at. So a beetle in Canada probably has different fungal associations, different ways of adapting to changes in the environment than a beetle from Arizona. So there is, you know, no reason to not believe that the same is true for their biotic community associations and these differences are you know largely due to differences in the environment of these populations sometimes they're subtle sometimes they're not but because research shows that the beetles themselves are highly adapted to their local environments you know we decided to see if their community associations are similarly determined by the local environment like do the same mite species occur across the border are there some that occur only in some populations or do they increase or decrease in some populations versus others and things like that yeah that makes total sense it's been well established that the fungal communities change um, with climatic variation and so it would make sense too then that the mite communities would also change right and by extension that kind of alludes to the fact that if there are different communities then the interactions that are happening could be different across these different populations that's right Mm -hmm. Because all ecological interactions occur along a spectrum from mutualistic, where both parties are benefited, to antagonistic, where one party benefits and the other is is harmed. And then in the middle, there's this commensal where, you know, one one party is benefited and the other uh, doesn't have any effects of it at all. So it's like it's a spectrum. Right. And so shifting the environmental factors can change where the interaction falls out along that spectrum. Yeah. So you looked at literally thousands of beetles. Yeah. Uh, So many beetles, so many mites. And you found some pretty big differences across the uh, mountain pine beetle range, right? Yeah. So we found that our northernmost population, Canada, had the least number of mites associated with beetles, while the populations that were more south of that, like Utah and Arizona and Colorado, they had much higher mite numbers than those Canadian beetles. Um, It's hard to pinpoint one specific reason for why this might be, although the firm speculation is environmental filtering. So differences in the environmental conditions experienced by these mites with some mites just, you know, favoring cooler environments and some favoring warmer environments. We also tend to observe fewer mites in populations with 
lots of mountain pine beetles. And Canada was at the forefront of an outbreak. So that means they had a crap ton of beetles, like probably like a million beetles out there. Wow. The exact reason for this, I, I don't know because these patterns vary across different beetle systems. So with other bark beetle species, there's more mites with more beetles. But we tend to see the opposite with mountain pine beetles. Oh, that's interesting. So with mountain pine beetles, the larger the beetle population is, the smaller the mite population is. That's interesting. Right. These mountain pine beetles are doing it different than other pine beetle species. I mean, I'm trying to reason this out myself in my head all the time. (laughs) (laughs) Right, right. (laughs) Other species right. show the opposite pattern. So the larger the population, mm-hmm. the fewer they have. So that's really strange that these mountain ones are doing this. Doing it. Well, it's just that their evolutionary stories are probably different, right? Right. I think that's one of the really cool things about science and especially ecology is that we do a study to find an answer and then we walk away with more questions than we started with. Like, why do these beetles do it this way and this different species do it that way? Yeah. It's kind of neat, actually. (laughs) So not only did the percentage of beetles that were carrying mites change across the landscape, so did the species of mites that were present. What were the major patterns associated with that? So we saw fewer species in Canada and the most number of species in Arizona. So it was like the opposite for northernmost and southernmost populations. And then we did some analyses of beta diversity. We were able to show that Canada's mite population is nested within its southern counterpart. So what that means is it's just a subset of the mites we're seeing in these southern populations. And that many species were likely eliminated because of the huge climatic differences in Canada versus those southern populations. Our Canada site was colder on average, no surprises there, than any right. other population. So that might be a strong reason for it. The mite load is just the number of um, mites that each beetle is carrying, right? Or it could be the number of mites in a whole population. It just depends on how you define it. And then I think you saw some differences there. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. We did actually find differences in the mite loads between southern and northern populations, but we didn't see differences between populations that were close to each other latitudinally. So, okay. yeah. It's kind of, there's so much going on in that paper, it's hard to like break things down sometimes. But basically, Colorado, Utah, and Arizona, they're, those populations are very close to each other on the, on the latitudinal gradient, and their loads didn't differ that much. But then if you look at Canada versus Arizona or Utah, then it really did differ. Yeah, that makes sense. Interesting. And this was really the first look at mite species um, and mite communities at this landscape level. So it's really a foundational work. Uh-huh. Um, um, if funding and time weren't issues, uh, what would be the next thing that you would do to build on this study? That's a great question. Um, I'm actually building off of this study in a manuscript I'm working on right now, which is also part of my dissertation. But I used a field reciprocal translocation experiment So what that means is I swapped environments of beetles from two different populations and then introduced them to a novel environment that simulates warming. And then I'm looking to see if those mite populations vary because we shifted their environments and created a warming situation. So that's just one little way I'm building on it. But if I did have all the money in the world and all the time, my real interest would be to look at the long-term evolutionary consequences of these changes in the communities and what exactly these interactions are. I would want to tease apart the effect of temperature versus those underlying genetic differences that are probably also explaining why some mites don't occur in some places, which is, you know, really hard. Um, Yeah. I'd also want to invest some more in the mite genetic work because most of our knowledge of mites is completely based on taxonomy and morphology. There is hardly any genetic stuff out there. I mean, there is for soil mites and stuff, but nothing with bark beetle mites. And unfortunately, everything that we know, even taxonomically, is still not entirely precise. So there is a fuck ton left to be learned about these guys. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I can see how the genetics question would be really interesting because you have the genetics of the mite, you have the genetics of the beetle, you have the genetics of the tree. Every time you add a new player into the ecosystem, the complexity just skyrockets. Yeah. It's because there's more and more interactions. And then when you in- include the environment in on that, it's just really out of control. It is really hard to tease apart. Oh, yeah. It's it's a challenge. And even just, I've tried mite manipulation and there have been other studies that do that where you physically manipulate the mite communities that go into a tree with the beetle. It is super, super hard. I've done it three times and each time it didn't really work out. <laughs> yeah, so if you're trying to move these little tiny mites around that you can hardly see with a microscope, it sounds like a royal pain in the ass. Yeah, there's also a lot of cryptic species. Which, so there's species that are masquerading as other species. And, you know, we don't really know. We'll just be like, oh, yeah, they're all the same. But they could have completely different functions and be completely different species. And there's honestly no way of telling them apart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. so, I didn't realize that stuff you know trying to find good genetic markers and things like that but it's it's slow going and challenging <laughs> I knew that the mountain pine beetle system was complicated but I didn't know how complicated it was uh-huh. <laughs> So you're starting to look at pinion pines too, right? Mm -hmm. Um, This pinion system is just fucking nutso. Yeah. (laughs) And we'll have an entire episode where we get into the weeds and all the crazy shit that happens um, out at Sunset Crater. But for now, just give us the quick and dirty on the pinion pine system that we have uh, near Flagstaff here. Yeah. So as most people already know, pinions are really common in the Southwest, iconic tree. But at Sunset Crater, they're particularly interesting because we see two types of these pinion trees. So if you look super, super carefully in this specific area, you'll notice that some trees grow tall and straight up and have lots of needles and and look really awesome while the others grow outwards and are more stunted and shrubby. And the reason for that is it's driven by this crazy ecological process (laughs) that is all thanks to this one moth that feeds on the needles of these trees. So the trees that grow taller and have, you know, the typical tree growth of a pinion, they are resistant to the herbivory of this moth. So they're able to fight off or defend themselves against the moth when it comes to eat its needles, but that's not the case for the shrubby one. So the needles keep getting eaten off the top and they grow stunted and shrubby because of that. And you only find this in these, you know, volcanic, low nutrient, arid soil environments around all these craters, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, If you go a little bit more south of that, you kind of stop seeing these two different pinion types. So it's really unique to this region. And there's a few other regions like in New Mexico and stuff where you see that as well. So what the cool thing is, though, is that later studies found that those shrubby pinions, even though they're not very good at defending themselves against the moth, they're a lot more tolerant to drought when things get bad and everything gets dry. But those tall ones are not as good as dealing with drought conditions, which was really cool. So it was like the opposite when it came to drought. Um, And this was important from a bark beetle standpoint because when a tree is stressed by drought, it's an invitation for bark beetles. And pinion pines are hugely susceptible to Ips confusus. It's my favorite (laughs) beetle scientific name because (laughs) they are quite confusing. (laughs) But yeah, like once the pinion is stressed out, they tend to go attack them. And you know, when I went out there, I was just just from visually looking at this landscape, it's very clear that those tall pinions are the ones that seem to constantly get attacked by bark beetles, but those shrubby ones seem to get left out. Okay, interesting. Mm-hmm. That's so just visual thing, though. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you're looking at the defense mechanisms mm-hmm. of these pinions, right? Yes. A- against the moth or against the bark? Against the bark beetles. So the moth is just the it's the thing that drives you know, the way these pinions grow and look. That's just like the driving factor that sets up this system. And I want to look okay. further into how that affects bark beetle selection and fungi that get brought in with bark beetles. Nice. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's cool. And where are you at in that? Are you setting up the experiment now? or So we've kind of done some preliminary stuff. So we went out there and we, you know, marked pairs of trees 
short and tall pears. And what we did was collect resin samples from the trunk of these trees. They've looked at resin from the needles, which is what would defend against moth herbivory. But like we wanted to look at those constitutive defenses that are in the tree trunk where bark beetles go and attack. So we collected a bunch of resin from these trees. And right now they're sitting in a lab in Wisconsin where they're going to look at the composition, the chemistry of this resin, like what compounds are in there. We're looking to see if there are certain concentrations of compounds that could be considered good defenses we're looking to see if there are more antifungal compounds or um you know things like that and if there are differences in the chemistry of these tall trees and these stunted trees and it's not just like they're visually different but their chemistry is also different right that sounds like a super great study i'm so excited to see the results of that oh me too (laughs) so is there a scientist that is uh either well known or otherwise that has changed how you think about biology or science in general? Yeah, definitely. I think mentorship goes a really long way. And if it wasn't for some of my teachers and professors, I wouldn't be here today. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll I'll be honest, I kind of fucked around in college a lot. That's what college is for. Yeah. Then uh, (laughs) I remember attending my plant systematics class. This is a 300 level course. I took him, it took it in my sophomore year because I'm crazy. But then I later <laughs> TA'd it a bunch of times, but I took this class and my professor, I have to put his name out there, Dr. Warren Hout, so passionate okay. and so good at teaching. And you know, I was convinced I was going to be a botanist. I could not stop collecting specimens, identifying them. I mean, I was enjoying writing papers. I was writing these crazy systematics papers for his class. And I think I was the only one enjoying it. But (laughs) (laughs) and I was convinced I would be a botanist. And then I took my first entomology class with Dr. Tom Schultz, also at Denison in Ohio. And, you know, so much active field work. And we were outdoors all the time. And and it really strengthened my resolve to stay in the field. Like I wanted to do things like this for a living. <laughs> so it was right. professors who really changed things for me. Um, and I still stay in touch with them. I share my research with them and everything. That's so awesome. Yeah, I, I have some of my undergrad professors that I stay in touch with. Yeah, it's really great. And- Okay, so last question is, what is the fuckiest thing that has happened to you while you're doing research? So that can be in the field, it could be in the lab, it could be in the greenhouse. So just what is the like the strangest, like what the fuck thing um, that you've had happen? So, you know, surprisingly, I've never had anything super weird happen to me because all my field work is local and I never run into people. I mean, I find weird things all the time. I mean, people dump all kinds of weird things out there. I mean, you find used condoms in places you should not find them at. <laughs> mm, yeah. Yeah. yeah but- Clean that up, you guys. Take that with <laughs> There was this one time, though, I was in the White Mountains with my husband doing some volunteer spruce aphid work for the Rocky Mountain Research Station. And I had to wake up at four or five in the morning and I really had to pee. It was freezing and there was fog everywhere. So I didn't notice Mm -hmm. that, you know, right next to the truck where he was sleeping was a giant herd of elk. (gasps) I know it was scary. I, I couldn't see them. So, I mean, I got out and I was peeing and then this huge male bugles at my naked ass. And I just jumped up and ran back into the truck because they realized there's a whole herd out there. (laughs) Awesome. Yep. (laughs) Yep. Yep. It it really scared me. Like, I mean, I was mid pee and this elk was... (laughs) The the last thing that I have for you is just um, where can people find you on social media? Well, I'll first, you know, put a plug on my ResearchGate profile. I'm not super active on it, but ResearchGate is what most researchers and academics use to put their research out there uh, for collaboration and conversation. It's honestly the best way to reach out for collaboration, which I'm huge on. It's how I get all my Mm -hmm. research done. I love collaborating with people. But you could also follow me on my Instagram, which it is a private account, but I do like to add fun research updates and I have a lot of posts on nature and really cool places. It is private though, so you will go through a screening process and I will choose to add you or not, but (laughs) you can always feel free to follow me on there. The 
tag is at Snay Ventura, so S N A Y V E N T U R A. Well, there you have it fungus and mites and beetle sex, not to mention elk hiding in fog. And I think the most important thing that we learned today was not to leave your condoms in the forest. Someone will find them. Music this week is Pondo Funk by Ron Deckert. Find his music on SoundCloud. Link in the show notes. Look for a cool-ass nature shit video on my YouTube channel where I show you beetle galleries and talk about how the lumber industry used the power of branding to make what was once a useless product into a luxury item. Big thanks to Sneha for being on the show, and thanks to Derek Yui who took the photo for this episode's art, a mountain pine beetle covered in mites. You can find a bunch more amazing photos of the natural world on Derek's Facebook page. Just search for Yui Photography. That's U-H-E-Y Photography. And as always, link in the show notes. Come back again in two weeks. That's February 17th. We'll hear the full interview with Dr. Gene Bosniak that he and I recorded for Episode 2, WTF Biologist, Rachel Carson. It was such a good interview, and we talked about way more stuff than Rachel Carson. We talked about biases, Elsa the Lioness, and where the mysterious place away is, and so much more. Follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at WTF underscore biology. If you have suggestions, questions, comments, or whatever, drop me a line at wtfbiology at gmail.com. See you guys again in a couple of weeks. <laughs>